every day, no, not, I wish it was every day, uh, every day I say, today I shall live, not just make it, you know, <laughs> not just survive. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm doing very well, though. <laughs> How's that going? <laughs> well, because I'm kind of, uh, I'm very other um, motivated. So I I jump to whatever request is coming my uh, way, right. and um, and and so at the end of the day I can be completely uh, finished, and um, and it's very hard. I'm I'm not saying I'm not living my life because that is my life. It's been like that for a long time, but but it is uh, an odd an odd thing. And it can feel like, I'm not saying that's more true, that's just part of that whole setup, that then it feels like just surviving, not 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 quite living, you know? How is that about you guys? Oh, that, that sounds fairly close to just what I'm doing. Yeah. But uh, oh. <laughs> well, I, I guess for me, it's just, just plain fatigue. You know, it's just... Um, the, the, the amount of things have to be done and which I have to do. So, you know, I, I guess it's just the fatigue that gets me down. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, uh, I, I've sort of, I'm, have an interesting um, experience of stress at the moment mm. because of the, the situation that we're in with buying and selling various properties. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sort of making that my, my focus of living. And uh, so that the attention to what's happening uh, as a, a visceral feeling, uh, which, which is quite interesting. And because we had another setback the other day and, and it sort of created a a very much a a physical uh, manifestation of a feeling and so i was just curious so i was sort of just you know sat there after getting over the initial shock you just sort of sit there and look at it as a as a how is how is this and it it's it becomes quite um or it became quite a useful um strategy and I think, I don't know whether they call that living, but I suppose it is. It's a sort of being aware of what, what, the, what life is rather than life just happening to you. It's just happening. But um, yeah, and, and, and uh, there's quite a few of them, I know, you can, <laughs> because of the, cause we have lots of different things going on. Um, but it's rather, and the, I think the thing is that there, it's not things that I can attend to, because there's nothing I can do about it. It's, these are things that are just happening, that are not within a control. So you can't actually do anything, to, which is an odd situation, certainly you know, from my point of view, because normally in my career, if there were things that were wrong, you could address them or at least find out what was going on and uh but this is isn't like that this is just things that happen and things that are out of control out of my control um so i so it's life and but i think the idea of being able to attend to it is is a, a useful uh, a useful one and i don't think i would have got that if i hadn't well i know i wouldn't have got that if i hadn't been on the on the old two-year course, but um, it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting. And I'm also quite interested in this idea of it being a physical uh, manifestation rather than an intellectual one, because it, it, it comes just from the body rather than something that I'm, and, and then comes into the mind as something to think about, not the other way around. Say that again with the body. Well, the, the initial 
reaction obviously comes in through either through reading or reading something or hearing something. So it's got to come in through a cognitive pathway. But the effect that then becomes manifested is a physical feeling. It's a sort of, I, I, I feel something. So it's, so I then have to think about it to, to focus on it. And if I don't do that, then it, it permeates the mind and the mind being the brain and the body. So if I don't focus on it, then the mind lets it ramble, lets it take, not take over, but lets it sit there and become the background feeling. And then only by looking at it, by examining it, by being curious about that, can it, does it, does it dissipate? So I think what I'm saying is that it's not, it doesn't, this is the opposite way around to the way I would have always thought about it. I was already have always thought that problems and stress come from uh, cognitive processes, come from thinking processes. But I'd, I'm sort of having looked at it, it doesn't seem to be, it seems to be the other way around. It seems to be come from the body mind, of the body and processing, but not from the brain, not from thinking, not in the sense of thinking rationally about something, sitting down there and working something through. So that that's a new, it's, it's, well, it's not sort of new, but it's because of the situation I'm in, um, it's become more evident. I've been able to sort of practice more. Well, I think it, I mean you're, you've got your, your awareness of that of those bodily feelings it must make you think. You know, what is this? Why am I? Why is my body feeling like this when it doesn't have to? Uh, you know, relax your gut. You know, relax your shoulders. You know, why is it like that? You know, I think you know that, that's what I find myself you know, asking sometimes when I sort of find those feelings in my, my, you know, basically tension reactions or stress reactions, and then sort of examining it and saying, why are you trying to get ready to fight or flight? There's, there's nothing to fight for. It's not under your control. Or, or if it is under my control, I say, okay, well, what can I do? And uh, I guess, yeah. So, yeah, I think very, I think uh, the fact that, you know, you can be aware that those feelings are, are sort of emanating from, you know, from inputs and stresses and environmental things going on, and that they're, you know, you know a guttural re reaction to, you know, to those events and happenings. But having looked at it and saying, you know, you know, you know body, why are you like this? There's not, there's no purpose in this. There's no purpose in being tense and screwing up what you've got and, and all this. Uh, just wait, <laughs> that's all you can do. If it's not under your control, it's not under your control. There's no, there's, there's not, nothing really worth, it's not worth trying to um, force yourself, I guess, or, you know. That, that's no, I, 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 no, no, no I, that pointless forcing is completely pointless, but yes. I, 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 being attentive, I found is very useful. <laughs> and it, and I'm not, I think the thing is also this idea of, you know, that why are you, you being like this body? Well, obviously it's not, there's no, there isn't a dualism. It's not, there isn't me and the body. There is just this experience. And there must be a point to it. It's just that the point is no longer a relevant one. I mean, from an in evolutional perspective, there must be a reason why you, it does this, why this happens. But psychological stress causing physical symptoms. 
you know, rather than yes. physical threat ca causing, phys uh, you know, uh, flight. Yes, or, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. So some, yes. And th there is, the, clearly has to be a, um, a reason for it in the past. It's just that the, it is not of much use now. Mm. Because presumably there was an opportunity in the past when these things originally arose that you could address them by doing something. So if, I wonder, you know, uh, if there was a, well, if there was a fire, you know, blazing in the, you know, then you'd, yeah. and it would cause you tension, your houses were burning down, you'd run away, you know, you could mm. actually think, right, this is causing me, mm. so I would do something about it. Mm. But there isn't anything that can be done in the circumstances that we live in at the moment, because things are so remote and, and hard to address or hard to identify, not identify, but hard to ameliorate hard to do anything about because of the nature mm -hmm. of our society. Um, but the stresses are still there, the, the, the mm -hmm. feelings, the attributes are still there. I'm guessing anyway, and I just sort of th mm -hmm. just thinking about it in those terms is... Uh, well, uh, the very fact that we have this cognition this, and this, you know, you know powerful cognition, you know, which is, you know, far, far surpasses that of, you know, even even our closest relatives, that that's possibly the source of all that, you know, worry, concern, and stress, and the source of all of you know the fact that we can communicate with you know, uh, you know vast numbers of people and groups, uh, which is a cause of stress in itself. So we've perhaps moved the uh, that the that the real actual physical stresses up into the into a cognitive level. Um, and uh, so all our suffering is now happening at that level. Well, not all of it, but but uh, you know, self-inflicted self harm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I don't know. Um, I, I I yeah. It, I think. I I suppose what I'm what's interesting is this idea of uh, of non-dualism. So there isn't a me thinking that the, these things are happening. There is only this thing that is happening. There can only be one thing that's happening. Um, and so I'm not sure whether it's the the, the cognitive sense. But your, your perception of it could be dualistic. It, it, it could be. Um, but in a way, you have, you, know, you have your perception of a of a feeling, which is sort of dual. Um, it is, and that's why, as I say, if if the the feeling is addressed, then it becomes less of a dualism, less of something looking at something as, oh, this is something, there is something, mm. and sort of just being in that feeling just there is that feeling it's not a pleasant feeling but it's a feeling it's a sort of there is this experience and uh that is a that's anyway anyway that's i'm i'm i'm, I'm not sure what else i can what else I can say about that? It's just oh, that's well, just that's a, it's just a way of 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 being, and I, it just seems to be that, and it must be for lots of people that there are circumstances beyond their control. You can't do anything about this. These things are beyond you, and yet those things create feelings, and we tend to think that they're feelings, or I have always tended to think that they're feelings that are happening to me. But that would mean that the, the that I am thinking about things happening to me, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, it can only be that there is a feeling. And it makes me closer to this idea of, of a mind-body thing, a brain-body thing called a mind. Because I was reading a book the other day and it, it kept talking about mind all the time. And I was getting a bit cross. I said, don't you mean brain? And then I was thinking, well, what's the difference between mind and brain? And so this has sort of led me to the idea that maybe 
that the experience is mind and that we can our brain is an organ mm-hmm. which makes it a bit more i mean that's the thing that does a lot of work but it's not everything by any means well when we speak of mind we are speaking of, of an, an abstraction um you know we can I mean, we cannot touch the mind we cannot sort of you know mold it and, and do all sorts of things you know with the mind uh it's not something that is tangible so it, it's something that, that a creation of our of our, our, our cognition perhaps yeah i suppose what is does cognition co- cognition is is there a difference between experience and cognition i think it's part of it it had feeds into cognition we have memories we have experiences all of these things feed into how we perceive things so feelings are part of cognition i think they have to be they have to be because because basically your 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 limbic system is basically feeding in, in into your into your cognitive areas and they're feeding back into those limbic areas uh, i mean it's it's a, a i think i guess giant feedback loops you cannot separate you know emotional feelings from from you know pure logical rational thoughts um you know they both have their origins uh, you know in 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 feeling so so those these things need to be yeah considered together they cannot be separated but but you know at the same time you know, there there are you know functional separations but in terms of the mind itself i mean that that is just a a, a cognitive creation i think um that that's basically being you know accepting inputs from from the entire body as a system yeah I, it's a bit Can complicated we only call experience what we are aware of or is experience more than that because cognition and i have a certain as as an awareness involved whereas you could you could be in an experience that only others can really perceive for example uh, you might be in it and have no clue so uh. it's experience uh just something that we call you know as a cognitive process is uh, only what i am aware of or is it something that i find myself in that i might be less or more aware of because it's still in, in, we are in our world most of it is not cognitive i would say so it's, it's only that little bubble that that is on the soup that is actually organized as, as really in our consciousness the rest is just running as a background uh, module all the time letting us be as we are you know it drives the car is that is driving the car an experience <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, it just 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 happens, isn't it? Uh, it just, um, yeah, well, it, it uh, you could say, oh, well, it happens, so it's an, it, it's clearly an experience. Well, no, I think you're is, right. Maybe it's not. It is a uh, accessible for cognition at any which point you could get very aware of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because something sparks cognition. But does that then spring up with the experience or was the experience there all along you know what yeah, no, it, I, it, it could be it but could hang on be. just a, just a second uh, 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 elfy you uh, for me anyway you sound as though you're under water is there oh it, it's a there's a funny um is that for you gary or is it just yes. me oh, all right yes it was quite difficult to follow it's like as a Is that better? No, it's, it's just the same. It's, it's like there's a reverberation on everything you say. Not quite an echo, but uh... um, okay. I might have to. I, I might have to rejoin. I will do that. Okay. Because right. I, I don't think I can. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah, it's still there. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, that's a good point about the driving. 
thing is that they mm -hmm. that we're I suppose that's getting to what I was thinking about in terms of the mind the ooh, mind mm -hmm. we must still have a mind while we're driving even though that we could be thinking about something else whilst we're automatically doing things a lot of it's very autonomous. I mean, when you're driving, especially, I mean, mm. certainly you might be concentrating, but you're, you know, you've got these very narrow foci, all perhaps all over the place, especially if you're driving in Indonesia. Um, <laughs> but, but actually, uh, yeah, driving is probably different if you're driving in Indonesia. You're probably aware of what you're doing all the time. If you want stress, come to Indonesia and drive yeah. a car. Yeah. Very easy. Uh, it's. I, I must do a video of it one day. Just, you know, I, I drive from here to my boat just to sort of see what sort of chaos I have to put up with. Yeah, well, I know <laughs> I've, 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 I'm what? familiar with that type of uh, situation. Yes, yes. I much prefer somebody else to do the driving. But, yeah. And but, then, you know, when, you, when you are driving, you're not really thinking about a lot. I mean, well, maybe you are, but you shouldn't be. But, you know, your, your focus is, you know, it's like being in a trance. And then a lot of, you know, all your, your, control is you know semi automatic you know uh, i guess if you're an experienced driver it's sort of you, know, yeah. you barely think about it yeah. um well i certainly know i do I, you know, I barely think about driving it's just you know almost automatic we start so is that cognitive then attention. so that's the i think i suppose that's what i was interested in is what mm. is it con cognitive or, or what yeah. is it yeah i'm, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure I have, Elfie, I have Elfie, say say something so that we can see whether your microphones. No, I can hear nothing. You're not. You you must be muted. I'm thinking. Yes. Oh. <laughs> say there something. <laughs> Bob's fallen oh. over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's still there, but anyway, we'll survive. Oh. Yeah. That's all right. It's not. It's not too bad. I mean, it's. Okay. We can hear what you're saying. It's just a bit weird. <laughs> It's normally Gary who sounds as though he's a... Yeah. Oh, I just so, had feedback then. It's all right, it's gone. How is that then? It's just the same. <laughs> no, I think that's probably slightly worse. I think it was easy. Are we using your microphone? Is it your... Yeah, I do. But yeah. I think it's the computer playing up. Yeah. Uh, Now I can't hear anything. So it's plugged in, but we can't hear anything now. Oh. Ah, ah, that's it. That's okay. That's okay now? Yeah, no. that's perfect. Oh, cool. That's, that's it. You've, oh, you've cured okay. it. Well, See, then. was that cognitive or just something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're just asking about, you know, when you're driving. I mean, are you using cognitive facilities or are you using feelings? Because half the time, I mean, I'm on, on auto mode when I drive. Now, I'm not really thinking as far as I'm aware of, uh, and I'm not even aware that you know, I'm just sort of focused on the road and trying not to kill people. You know, that, that's really my only focus. Am I, you know, am I cognizing? To what degree am I cognizing? To what degree am I sort of on autopilot? And I think a large part of it, you know, especially for uh, perhaps an experienced driver, it would, it would be you know, automatic almost. Um, with, with, there may be cognition involved, obviously. There's, there's obviously perception and all sorts of things going on, but the processing of that, of that information, I mean, we only have, a, I, I guess, the barest of awareness of all these inputs coming in, and they only come to our attention when something happens and, uh, and sort of you know, we, we shift focus to, to you know, some sort of threat or, or, or situation. Um, so. It's hard to say whether you call that cognizing or, or not, and to, and to what to, to what degree you are actually aware. You have have any awareness when you're driving? It's an interesting one, isn't it? I think all these terms are not very well defined, and especially mm -hmm. if if you think of it very much in this way that we are in the world just as this. Um, and it might be easier to call it perception. So that, you know, obviously, perceiving is is the base layer of it all. If you don't perceive anything, 
there will be no response to it. So, so perception, or that has to be a given. Cognition would be, for me, a meaning-making, and that can be either aware or unaware, I guess. So the driving mm -hmm. of the car is mostly unaware meaning-making. It is very meaning-making, you know, if you try to to do it with artificial intelligence, you have a problem. So it's it it it's very meaning making. Who who do I save? You know, the child or the the old person and all those things that we get into trouble with with artificial intelligence driving. Um, so it's uh, but and then there is that little little bit of cog of of um, of aware cognition where I get a choice and I get for me the whole course and all that was just one more way of honing the ability to have more and more of that awareness in the whole game because only with awareness for me comes choice only then the rest of it is reactive uh, and might be very well adapted and might be very badly adapted and, and the adaption happens very early on when I have hardly any skills, I think. Being taught by people who have very few skills. I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, and, and our parents, bless them, they, they had very few skills in that way of, so that they couldn't teach me very well to, uh, when, I, when little, to respond on a feeling level, on a non-aware level, they, well, they taught me many things very well, like to eat when I'm hungry, whatever, you know, because all that needs to be done. So all I don't think you need to be taught that. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, some people struggle with that and we call it anorexia. <laughs> it's okay. just really cool, you know. So I don't know where, the, where you end that. But so there's obviously a lot that I've learned very well. Uh, and then there's some kind of higher faculty that go into the kind of, are you getting wise? Are you wisdom? And they are hard fought for because I don't think we are not getting taught them very well because our parents, when they have us, don't know them very well either. So we don't get it culturally. We sure don't get it much, you know, by by t trying ourselves because we have very few skills when these things get embedded so it's a it's always a, a later day acquisition i think of getting mm -hmm. getting to question the reactive feeling what we call feeling is this basic layer of responses either physiological or early learned behavior responses to stuff and that's what we call reactivity and then often it's not very well adapted because it's a very unskillful not very well taught being that reacts I, for me i think that's that's very that's a very good um summary of the situation that we find ourselves in and it, it reminds me of something I think Gary said a long time ago when we were on the course about education as being mm -hmm. a foundational element of what this this ought to be, this the the understanding of reactivity, that that it really ought to be something that's taught in schools. And you sort of think, well, why couldn't it be? And because it would be much easier to do it when you're younger, to because you you get so many of these these things that you react to and it would be very straightforward you'd think to be able to look at them um, when you're young because they wouldn't have the power that they have later on and when they become embedded and they become something that is uh, we have habitual responses to so we, before we develop the habitual responses we could um, learn what those feelings are and their value or their lack of value. 
I, I was actually thinking about that same thing about that, you know, about education, you know, before you mentioned, I was sort of recalling something that, that you know, was discussed about that at the course. Um, but, but I think, you know, one of the problems for me as a as an educator, in, in, in this case, in my capacity as a parent, uh, you know, it's um, difficult to, to teach Dharma in environments where it's not really fully supported or understood. However, I think, you know, that the, there really is only one, you know, that the gold standard, I guess, is you know how do you behave and how do they see you behaving in in in, re, in, in response to certain situations. Um, you know that that's what you know, children learn by by looking at situations and seeing how people respond. Um, and you know, obviously, if they if, if they see people responding explosively to every little uh, problem, then obviously they're going to to absorb that as being, you know, normal responses. Um, I'm just hoping that, you know, if I've got any example at all, uh, that, you know, it's my example rather than necessarily what I say to them that, that's uh, going to, to teach them uh, a bit about what Dharma is. It's yeah, interesting because yeah. you got a little one, haven't you? I mean, there you oh. have all this knowledge now, oh, yeah. and you've got a, a little one. This is actually, I, you know, oh. I don't think of it. It's really interesting, and how mm -hmm. you, you know, you have that opportunity, or, or and, and not to get it perfect, but at least to observe actually if that would work, if if mm -hmm. it can be taught, how it can be taught. Um, how it can be demonstrated, as you say, mm -hmm. more than than explicitly taught. Mm -hmm. But you know, to to um, to bring up a questioning mind. I mean, what a delight that would be in the, in that way, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? And say, yeah. uh, rather than something that gets bashed with statements all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's that's what happens with the. Indonesian educational system. You know, it's a very pretty primitive system, uh, very authoritarian, very sort of you know, chalk and talk, and, and even the talk is pretty bad quality. Uh, you know, it's they, they get pushed through that machine, and I've had lots of kids go through that machine. Um, you know, and there's really not a lot you can do to influence that. In fact, you know, the the the, the impacts of the outside world that can be just completely overwhelming and sort of completely belittle any effort that I might make to sort of uh, look at things a different way or, or to demonstrate that there might be different ways of looking at the world. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I mean, uh, even my older children, um, I mean, I think that, that they're far more questioning than, than other Indonesian children, far more questioning. They, they certainly, I certainly didn't, Teach explicitly teach them that, um, and you know, and it's not as if they're particularly, you know, talented or or, or or you know, outstanding in any particular area. They're just normal kids. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, you can still do something even even in a, an environment where everything is really against you, um, and, and particular. Well, I guess not accepting uh, little little England, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, the way that England is tearing itself apart. Uh, I mean, I mean the, the same pressures uh, exist here, that the same sort of, you know, overwhelming pressures to conform to certain uh, standards of certain elite groups. Um, you know, it, it's all, all pervading, that, that, I guess that's the idea. So against that sort of, you know, that sort of aggressive environmental background, you know, you've got to sort of try and raise children that are, have some sort of self-awareness and have some sort of concept that, you know, uh, that I guess that patience and compassion is really the basis of all their, of all their responses, that, that, that should be their, their foundation. Um, 
And I mean, and, and compassion isn't necessarily a default. I mean, it's 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 sometimes has to be taught, uh, you know, or demonstrated. But you know, to think that you know people are, are, are you know are always naturally born nice and compassionate and you know mm. and good, well, that's not not so. They they basically follow their parents or their their, their peer groups in, in their particular. Ah, but that's environment. not the same as they they're not necessarily born that way. If they follow their if they learn it, they might be born that way. They might all be probably born. a bit of both. Yeah. Probably a bit of both, I'd say. Uh, that, that there would be genetic propensity to a particular way of uh, um, you know dealing with the world, uh, but you know almost everybody can be taught. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I've I've been interested this last week in something because I've been something I was reading about and then something I was thinking about, which is the nature as back back to language and it's the net but it's the nature of opposites and what it means for something to be opposite something else and the more i thought about it the more i couldn't think of anything that was an opposite of anything else and then i was reading this um stuff about uh, taoism and, and the tao where mm. you have yin and yang but this guy was saying well actually that's not the case in china it's not called yin and yang it's called yin yang and it's it's not two things it's one thing so whilst we have tended to interpret yin and yang as being two sides to to the opposites black and white light and dark in fact in in um from a chinese perspective it's not from a taoist perspective it's it's one thing and the one thing has extremes or has differences extreme differences but it's all one thing it's like two sides of the same mm. coin and the nicest nice. way the nicest way i i i heard it explained was originally yin and yang the two words mean light and shade as in the sun passing over a hillside so if you look at a hillside and this is very interesting from a painter point of view because if you look at light at one moment light and shade is there and then you look in the next moment light and shade is there but differently because the you, the sun is in a different place so the shade is different and the light is different so we the things are the are the same uh, but the light and the shade have just moved so the idea that light and shade would be opposites is is becomes then um complete it, it, meaningless because the thing that was dark is now light and the thing that was light is now dark so it's it, it makes sense in terms of it being things that just move and things that change rather than a definitive light this is light and this is dark so i was thinking about what that meant for anything in terms of opposites and you could see that nothing well i couldn't then think of anything that was op which was what I would have termed before an opposite. Everything seemed to be just uh, gradations. There's no absolutes. There couldn't. Well, I couldn't think of anything then that was an absolute opposite to anything. So the meaning of the word opposite changed for me to become almost meaningless. Um, and it's the same thing with so many things, I suppose, in language, that when you start to look at it, we use it in a way that it, we think is useful, but in fact, um, probably disguises what the actual event we're trying to describe is. We're not very, we use words and the words obscure the reality. So the word opposite obscures the reality that there is no thing as opposite. Well, it doesn't obscure it, it approximates it. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'd see in the past, I would have thought the word opposite meant something. Mm -hmm. And it would have meant this thing is completely and utterly different. The other end of 
it's just different it's not the same this is the same this is life is different completely and utterly from death they're the opposite but in fact it's not the case they're just yeah. different well, experiences think, i did think about i think you mentioned something about binary uh something last few weeks ago um but i'm thinking that you know this whole um i mean, I mean, I mean binaries are just tools because we need points of comparison and so we set up these artificial sort of you know uh, beginning points and end points as, as a way of gradating sort of uh, uh, something whatever it is and of course it could it, in most situations we're not just doing dealing with two points but we're dealing with a whole matrix of different points uh, which are sort of approximating uh, uh, you know, beginning points and end points. Uh, they're just abstractions, um, but, but they're just, I guess, useful to, to I guess, make meaning. Yeah, I understand. I, all I'm saying is, very specifically, the word opposite, for me, didn't have that. It didn't have a sense of a continuum. The word opposite mm -hmm. meant that this was completely different from the mm -hmm. thing that it was opposite to. That's what the word mm -hmm. meant. And now it doesn't seem to have that meaning anymore. And I'm well, sort well, of, well, I'm, st I'm sort of still, because if I say the word opposite, then immediately, oh yeah, that's something is completely different to that. So it still has that, even though I'm thinking, it, well, it can't do. So I'm in, I'm in a transition mode, but that, I'm not sure that everybody knows, it's just a word, but that word has, I have learned that word as having a meaning. It no longer seems to have that meaning if I think about it, even though my immediate visceral reaction to the word opposite still has the same effect as I as the learned one. That's but, but you would see that, that there could be a, a contrast along some sort of, you know, 2D or 3D continuums. Uh, no, uh, be, uh, of course, absolutely. If you, put, if you put, if you put, and if you put limits on those particular factors you can you can you can establish a beginning point and end point at, at which point of, of course a, absolutely no i have no problem i'm just talking about the word opposite and i'm using it i suppose as an example of how we use language to obscure reality mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. that's what i'm saying i'm not sure it's the same for everybody and I, it's just me i for me it had a particular meaning which when i thought about it and heard other ways of expressing it that I recognized that that the meaning that I had attached to it or that had been attached to it for me was um, incorrect and obscured the nature of what actually is mm -hmm. that's all yeah. that's what I'm saying so I just I, I, I'm, I'm just I wonder whether this is the case for lots of things so I'm now looking carefully mm -hmm. at words well, funnily enough, I've been thinking about well, the past couple of weeks yeah. about the word definition. And, uh, maybe, maybe we need to define definition. Yeah. Good, good point. <laughs> a, a, lot, a, a lot of people have misunderstood. Me. That's you know, a very so good starting this, point. Yeah. They have a, a concept Excellent. of definition, which, which I don't have. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. guess for most people, a, you know, a definition is something very hard defined, defined yeah. sort of a very hard, hard edge, hard edge sort of concept. Yeah. For me, defini definition is a, is a is a ball, a three D ball with lots of different points and lots of different, you know, it, you know, definition can be scoped. You know, you can sort of have a, a narrow scope definition or, or, or wide scope definition, but the problem is people rarely actually specify how they're scoping their, 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 their words. That Indeed. is, that is, that is, I love this. I mean, Rupert, that's really, I mean, that, that is, I've, I've come across it. Uh, Wittgenstein says things like that and, 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 um, um, uh, so it it and yeah you put it into words that i can really work with it so that i'm really that's fascinating and so true and it's so amazing to hear that gary you have a completely different way of looking at it anyway and is that is that um uh 
a, a viewpoint that that any IT person, or not any, but but someone who's really into coding would have, or is well, that I, your thing? Well, it is. I think certainly it's my thing, but I certainly absolutely certain that programming really reinforces that sort of thinking. Does it? Uh, well, I, gosh, I'm, you're ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, mean, I mean, all I think is data. I'm, 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 I'm a database programmer. That, that's my, my area, is, is, is database programming. Uh, so data manipulation and, and that sort of thing. That, that's what I so you wouldn't your... have used Excel for the for the data of the pandemic. <laughs> uh, well, well, actually, you know, you, there's nothing wrong with using a bit of Excel. I would never touch it myself. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but, you know, it's got to be served up in a, in, a, in a proper way. It's just you know, it's just got to be a a presentation. That's that's what Excel is. It's a presentation format. Uh, it's not sort of, you know, a data generating program, you know, goodness, I mean, what are they thinking? <laughs> I mean, you know, there's, uh, yes, but anyway, I think, you know, data, data, yeah, <laughs> I think data science structures, programming, and, and that sort of, that sort of thinking and, and, and uh, object oriented programming and all that sort of thing. Does affect the way that you actually look at the world, uh, and but you know I've been like that since I was, whenever. Uh, but but certainly that I'm absolutely certain that that you know program and I didn't actually start programming until computers came were invented, of course. So you know I, I didn't really start early at all because computers weren't invented then. Uh, so it wasn't until about you know what was it in that 27, 28 before I started first used my first computer and you know by that but you know what once that happened it was all over you know that was uh, that was what I did so yeah but, but yeah it certainly reinforces perhaps pre-existing things which might have already been because the, the fact is that not everybody can program well no that's not true people a lot of people can program Every, anybody can be taught to do some programming but to be a programmer is a completely different thing you know, and it requires a certain, and, and you see these uh, uh, stereotypes of, you know, of IT geeks and things like that, you know, those people are real, and that's what they are like, you know, it's, it's not an act, you know, uh, there, there seems to be a particular personality type that actually can actually do programming in particular, not, not IT in general, but programming in particular requires a particular focus, uh, which uh, a lot of people don't have or don't want to have. Uh, because it's rather antisocial, you know. I mean, just this past couple of months, I've been, I barely walked and got out of this uh, this house. Not because of lockdown. I mean, this is the, lockdown is my normal state. So, but, but you know, that sort of you know constant uh, uh, focus, you know, for hours and hours and days and sometimes weeks and months, you know, without a break. You know, that sort of focus, not many people would want to do that. Um, and even if they wanted to, they might find it very hard to do. So I definitely think there's a certain phenotype out there, you know, some sort of you know, rough phenotype which, which actually gets pulled into this sort of programming uh, paradigms. And is actually sort of, you know, which is why people, I guess, find, you know, IT, what, what they think are IT geeks, so sort of, you know, a little bit different. Uh, and I think, you know, partly that's sort of, uh, partly self-inflicted by, by years and years of programming. You know, it does affect you. Well, it must, uh, apart from the, the focus, but if it entails, uh, you know, um, insights like that, like mm -hmm. what Rupert just said, you know, which is, which is really uh, for for brain like mine, which is not like that, is is a real insight and that you know a real game changing. I will forget again, I dare say, because you know these things need to be detected many times for me, it seems mm -hmm. like, before I can make use of it. But um, 
in the, if if they come with insights like that, um, then then that's an amazing thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you say, oh, that's that's my definition of a definition, and it is this mm -hmm. kind of blob thing, rather than mm -hmm. what goes on in my head is this pinprick, you know, point. Mm -hmm. That is it. Yes. Or like like Rupert's example is is fabulous with the opposites and then and the yin yang thing. And there's mind body, isn't it, in in the Sanskrit or, or Pali, where, where where our Western mind can only just handle it by tearing it apart. And if you mm -hmm. say mind body, it already gets a bit confusing. So what is that? As it, so the, our our mind definitely goes into this kind of tearing apart, uh, finding the opposites, finding the differences. And finding it difficult to do synergy all the time, to do, to do, to com combine, and think of multifaceted. Uh, that's that seems to be so much harder. So if it if it um, features that and uh, encourages that kind of thinking, that's big, I think. It's really interesting that the way Gary you talk and. You would, because you would sort of assume from the outside that programmers dealing with like if you, what you would think is a bin binary system, zeros and nords, yeah, would be the opposite of something which would be expansive. You would think, in terms of definitions, you would be it would have to become tighter. But what you're saying is mm. the opposite that that the nature of the definition is that it, it is, um, I don't know, globular, it's well, not. Well, I guess I mean, data science is about structuring complexity. Uh, and, and, you know, data is complex. I mean, it, especially if, it, if it, you, you don't have the, you know, a binary mindset, uh, which of course, many people these days seem to have. I mean, when, you, when you've got, you know, when you see data and, it, and it's, you know, full 3D glory, and, 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 and it's extremely, you know, data is extremely messy, and, and to try and, you know, extract anything useful out of it requires, you know, more than just sort of 2D uh, data methodologies. Yeah, I, I guess think this that, is, that makes yeah, sense. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it is so relevant for our situation today, because we, we really see this clash of politicians and epidemiologists who might be very embedded in this mindset mm -hmm. of Gary's, you know, they deal with complex data all the time, and they see the blobness mm -hmm. of it, and say, mm -hmm. well, this is complex, it could be done like that or like that, yeah. and the politicians can only work, well, shall we lock down or not, uh, and mm -hmm. that's very binary, and, and that, that clash happens on a daily basis at the moment isn't mm -hmm. it and, yeah, and they well. do not understand each other at no. all <laughs> yeah that's, that's clear right. you know yeah. they can not really talk to each other very well mm -hmm. because the yeah. politicians are why don't you just tell me this or that and uh, mm -hmm. and and uh, the programmers and epidemiologists and data processors say well <laughs> Well, it's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. But it's so it's so true. And if you look looking as I have been at this you know, the American situation where you've you just have two alternatives. You can either be Republican or Democrat. And you, you have to register mm -hmm. in order to vote, you have to register apparently as a as a member or no as a Republican or a Democrat or an independent. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I didn't you, know that. Yeah, you have to actually say that <laughs> oh in order God. to be able to go and vote. And you think, well, well, but a lot of people, they would have said when they were younger, I'm Republican, and they've never voted Republican. And equally, the other way around, you could say you're a Democrat when you registered to vote, but you can vote, you can vote for anybody you like. But in order to vote, you have to say you are a Republican, a Democrat, or a independent and it's one of the things that they do in polling is that to make sure when they when they do the polls to make sure they get a, a, the right amount of people they ask them are you a registered voter and if if so then who are you registered with republican democrat or independent so unlike in in britain and i guess most countries where there are lots of different parties that you can vote for you can't do that in in america you can vote for different 
presidential candidates, but you can't vote for different parties because there aren't any, there are only two, or, and then independents. So you could vote for, you could be an independent um, presidential candidate or a senatorial candidate, but you can't be another, belong to another party. You can't belong to the, because they just, they just don't exist and you can't be registered um, for them. So it creates an incredibly binary position. So no matter, so you have to decide that you might be very radical on, on sort of left wing, or you might be very middle ground, but you've got to decide whereabouts you belong and who you're going, which party you're going to be, you're going to vote for or apparently belong to, even though you're, you may disagree entirely with the nature of that, that um, the idea of that as a, as a, an electoral entity that, you know, that, the party hierarchy and of course as democrats or republicans then you have to present yourself as belonging to if you're a politician belonging to those um that, that party's uh ideology so it's 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 odd it's very interesting to look at but it does mean that as you were saying Alfie, that it it sort of creates the opposite of what life actually is you're being given binaries and you'll be given these are your only options whereas that's the opposite of, of how people think and how people are because we we don't belong within that at all and i just wonder now whether america's is getting to the situation where this is becoming unsustainable and i'm not, not that sure why it happened in the first place but it does seem to be breaking down because there are there are so many different factions within this and there's there's, there's talk that the republican party might might split after the election if trump loses which he almost certainly will lose because there'll be there's a the trumpian perspective and then there's the traditional Republican perspective, which is very non-Trumpian, but everybody's been having to follow Trump because he was their presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. Which I would be a very good thing. Lose. You know, <laughs> well, I've just bet on him, so he, it's bet on him to lose. So he, he has to lose. I now. think he will win again. Uh, uh, yeah. well, anyway, but that's not yeah. not to say that what yeah. the rest. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> So it's a, it's a structural political structure which is trying to fix everybody and it's impossible you can't fix everybody into this structure you have to there has to be more flexibility in the system well i think you find most uh, uh most countries in the west at least uh, are suffering uh, in a pretty much the same symptoms, you know, whether or not they got them from the US or not, who knows. But, you know, you have this, this, this polarization, this, this, uh, uh, this, this dualism, mm. uh, where, where, you know, you have, you know, polls and elections sort of invariably sort of go sort of to the, you know, 50-50 almost. And you get these patterns consistently across uh, nearly all so-called democracies where, where eventually you'll get a a polarization uh and you know and 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 basically you know, two different tribes uh you know, yeah tribes. I'm, I'm not sure that's the case though because there are many countries in the west which have coalitions and uh, but they, uh, they don't have first past the post electoral system no but that's that is the majority <laughs> The majority yeah. of, of European countries in the West do not have first past the post. Yeah. There's only. I, I didn't actually mean Europe. I actually meant uh, you know, Anglo European. Well, if you look yeah. at the US, US, Canada, Australia, uh, right. UK, okay. uh, yeah. New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, except yeah, no, New I've... Zealand. Not, not New Zealand because they don't have a, the same sort of electoral system. They have a, 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 you know, a proportional system. Yeah. Once well, you have I... a proportional system, you're forced into coalitions. Yeah, which is a much better way, I think, much better, because then you Absolutely. you don't have this polarization, because then you can yes. have, um, uh, you can belong to smaller tribes. And then yes. the more, smaller and smaller, smaller tribes you have, that seems to be a much better thing that you then, well, we then have to work out and agree 
and we'll have a shared level of understanding about what it is that we want to achieve rather than mm -hmm. them just being one way of doing things so yeah you're right that it's to do with the nature of the voting system which creates it maybe that was what's mm -hmm. created the republican and democrat system in america i don't know i'll have to look read some history mm -hmm. as to see where it came about but i've only mm -hmm. just sort of been looking at the the outcome which is what they've got at the moment but there is a suggestion that that seems to be uh, falling apart yeah. certainly looks like it from the outside it certainly does anyway he's not he's not going to win don't worry don't worry oh i'm not really worried about him no no i was, was, was it was elfie he's not <laughs> he's not <laughs> <laughs> Why is that at the moment this kind of loss of coherent the the, the, um, the sense of common it, that there is something in common uh, in in these states in the, the polarization is is unhindered maybe there's always good polarization but there's also the feeling of that uh, there's a belonging together but this belonging together seems to be very diminished at the moment this um... well it's a, it's a winner takes all system, system i mean for, for the most part unless you've got you know uh, um, a proportional uh, representative system uh, all you're going to get is you know tweedledee and tweedledum you know it's just going to be same old same old every single time i don't i'm not sure i think this is different mm. i think what's happened i can't think of a time in the past where there would have been so much adulation for one individual as there is among trump supporters for trump it's he's not a political party he, his views are not Republican, traditional Republican values, but he, he has be, he's idolized in a very odd way as, I mean, you, the, you know, just reading about what people, how people talk about him is very different than how people would have talked about George W. Bush. George W. Bush was a, you know, a Republican, and he was elected twice, but he was elected twice because he was the head of the Republican Party and people voted Republican or they voted Democrat. People vote, vote for Trump because he's a Republican. They vote for him because he's an individual and an idealized individual. And I can't think of a situation where maybe had, if Kennedy had survived, he might have had that. But I can't think of any other presidential candidate, maybe Reagan. But I don't know, I'm not sure that he was, I, I was too young, I think, to think about but what, but I, I, there seems to be something different about Donald Trump and about the nature of this sort of idea of populism, that there are individuals that become the center of adulation, not, it's not a political, it's not a you know, political point of view. You don't vote for them because of their their political views. You vote for them because they're an individual, and that is that. That's not the same as most the politics that I've grown up with. I can't. There's never been that in Britain. Boris gets the closest to it, but you know, and maybe there was a bit of Thatcher in that. But not quite. Well, uh, not the this could be. Yeah, you know, I think this could be. You know, why people actually vote for these sorts of uh, you know demagogues. Uh, I mean, I mean, a significant number of people actually, you know, voted for it. Absolutely. And, and but and, and so and so you got to ask. Well, you know, well, are they complete idiots? And you know that that, that could be a point. We cannot dismiss that. Well, it depends, <laughs> like, but it, we need definitions no, for idiot now. But, 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 it's, but it's not everything. Uh, I mean, to, to my mind, I mean, what, what the, certainly about the, the American system, it was really about just smashing a system which wasn't working. People were voting for Trump just to sort of say, you know, let's fuck this system up. Who cares? Yeah, let, let's, put, let's put the 
uh, the reality show star in as president. That'll be fun. That'll really fuck things up. A lot of people are thinking like that. They're just completely sick of uh, being, you know. Yeah, that would have that would have made sense four years ago. It would have made sense. It doesn't make sense doing it again. I oh, know. Well, I don't think it will. I don't think there'll be quite as many of those uh, people when you do that. Still, time. millions mm -hmm. upon millions. Anyway, I don't. But know. yes. Well, like I said, they cannot dismiss the, the possibility that you know there's a lot of stupid people out there, and uh, for some reason they feel disenfranchised. And of course, there's also a lot of people who are, are exploiting uh, this uh, this uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, Trump and these other you know, cronies exploiting the situation in order to sort of you know get obtain political objectives, usually economic. So you know there's a huge power grab and 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 it's being used like a like a tool, which he is. <laughs> yeah, well, I, don't, I, do. I cannot accept that they're stupid people. And I, the closest that Trump comes to definite for me is Hitler. I mean, he had that crack the same way. Um, an absolute natural at doing something like that. And the Germans didn't vote for the Nazi party either or for for any of the, of their policies, really. They voted for him. And so he had that cracked in the same way. And if you uh, see the, the kind of language and the principles that, that builds, they're very similar. Make Germany great again could have been Hitler's uh, sentence and, and was. So it, it's, it's actually very, very parallel. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, and I don't know if I can call it stupidity. It is really unskilledness. There is a, for me, in my, in my you know, from, from knowing individuals very well throughout my professional life, there are people who have a strong inner sense of being. They, 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 in the way of, they know who they are, even if it's not spoken, but they experience themselves in that way all the time as, oh, I don't seem to be like that. I don't agree with this. I have a strong intuition for that. Uh, it's not, it might not be um, aware, but it is lived. You know, I go into opposition with so many things. If you think of me, you know, I go into opposition of uh, conventional medicine very often. That is a strong inner stance, even if I perceive myself as rather, rather meek, I clearly am not because I don't toe the line very well. But there are the other half of people and it's like, it's the difference between having an inner skeleton or an exoskeleton. There are good many people who get their strength from approval from the outside. So that it, their strength comes from being uh, in, uh, in, if they're in a work environment, they will, they will uh, do what the others like. And, and their strength comes from um, uh, being, uh, uh, doing right by others, being praised, being, being, so I think that kind of inner, in um, orientation is really exploited by people like Trump, who says, make America great again. Then I can be someone because America is great. So you, you give uh, that kind of orientation and an exoskeleton and it, that they love you for it. They kill for you because now they got something that gives strength. And it is like, it's like a, a something from the outside around them, when inside there isn't much, there's a blob. Um, and and I, it, it's almost like 50-50, but now maybe not quite, I don't know how many it is, but I know a lot of people who are exoskeleton people. They need that strength from their environment and they look for it in their environment. I don't think it has anything to do with their intellectual capacity. They're very intelligent people and they follow a Trump. What's that about? And, and there, there's hardly anything in them because he tramples them all in the end. If you get close to him, you get burnt. So 
there, and, and yet he seems to have a never ending stream of people who quite like to give him their intellectual capacities. It's, it's a weird thing. That's, that's really interesting. Is there any, is there any thing that you've read that, that has sort of reflects this? Is that because I'd be very interested to to read understand more about this idea, or is this just something that is from your experience? This is just from my experience. I've right. never seen that. Uh, I've never seen that. Um, yeah, explained anywhere. Because it seems to be absolutely on the point. It seems to be very. It seems to be the case. That's how I think. But again, it's not, it can't be black and white. It can't be opposites. <laughs> there has no. to be. There has to be. <laughs> it cannot be, and it isn't. They so are has, fallen have, into the trap again, you know. So there has to be. Maybe an orientation. Yeah, in, and, and there has to be a spectrum of this. So I wonder whether there's been some research into how and why is this something that we that's innate, that's genetic, or is it something that is cultural? Or, and what is, how do we define in broad terms what it is to be like that? Sort of, sort of why, why, are, I mean, presumably we like it because we like the idea of tribal tribes and we like belonging. So there's a security in the belonging. But what you're saying is it's, it, it's more than that. It's something that is a strong it's identity identity mm -hmm. and, and identity, identity with a group or with, a, with someone with a, it's not even a one. group it's one or an idea it's rather like so with oh, a leader then i am someone it is and and it's very leader orientated yeah that's an interesting thing i wonder if there's something about leaders that people have done research on what makes a lead because you you sort of read about it in literature and things like we hear the natural leader or she was a, like a, a natural leader and i i've never thought about that i've never actually thought that i wanted to follow anyone you know so i've never thought what what makes a leader i don't have the capacity to think that oh yeah there's somebody i was always always rubbish when i was in football teams now it, i was i couldn't work for the collective, I was, I, I was, so I, I don't have that capacity, but you can obviously see it in other people's but I don't know what it is because I can't, I don't have anything that tells me, ah, yeah, that's, that's what these other people have got that I haven't got. So I think it's like what Boris got you. It's, it's what sometimes called charisma and sounds rather nice. And actually I think it's much more mundane. It is being talked about being heard on a daily basis with such outrageous stuff because it clearly is it doesn't have to be true uh, it doesn't have to make sense uh, it just has to be newsworthy so because um, the, your followers will um, say, you know, just like Hitler said, let's kill all the Jews, they are the, the origin of our malaise. And people who would vote for him would say, ah, oh, he doesn't mean that. Just in the same way as Trump gets away with these outrageous uh, statements. When you ask the followers, they say, ah, oh, it's not really like that. You know, so they do all the hard work of getting that into some kind of sanity. He doesn't have to do that. And, and even Boris works on that. He's, he can say world beating uh, <laughs> uh, uh, tech track and trace and everyone laughs about it. Everyone says, yeah, <laughs> in your dreams. And we still vote for him because it's just, we get addicted to the outrageous you know, why has Trump so many followers? People are hanging on his lips. What is the next outrageous thing that he will do or say or whatever? And that will do the trick. It doesn't have to be true, make sense, anything like that. It just has to be something that I've never heard before. And that's why he will ring again, win again, because the <laughs> Americans are addicted to his outrageousness. Look at Biden boring 
and 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 I they can't let go of Trump. I don't think so. Yeah. Well, I I think you're right it, to an extent, and I just the the thing is, and that whilst whilst it works once, I don't think it works twice, and I because you've have you've had four years, or Americans will have had four years, and the British would have had five years to do more than just make excuses for the leader. And there are, there are a number of people because of the spectrum, because everybody is not black and white, and we, I will always follow this person. There's a, because there's a spectrum, there are some people who are saying, actually, after four years of li listening to this, I've changed my mind, and I'm not going to follow that person anymore. And I would rather have anybody. I don't need another figurehead. I just don't want this person anymore. And that's why Boris won't win the next time and Trump won't win the next time. Because it's May it be so. <laughs> well, I, I think <laughs> Boris won't win because I don't think he'll be there. I think the Conservatives will have recognised that he's a mistake. And the Republicans should have done that. They should have realised that he's not going to win. Therefore, we should have got rid of him and have somebody else. And if they had done, they might well have won the, the election. Because the, all they had to do was put somebody who wasn't Trump in charge, and I think they would have won. But Trump will lose, and Boris will lose. There we are. Look, I'm upset. Gary, yeah, but, but, programming but Boris, mind, well, Gary. Well, <laughs> no, you say but, last one, one more thing. <laughs> well, you know, I sort of look at things, these particular things, maybe a little bit differently, and I don't know. Uh, maybe because of my, I guess, background in political canvassing and, and polling and all that. But, you know, I always follow, you know, who is voting and who is not. And I mean, the, the difference in the last US election was the number of pe people voting. Uh, and the enthusiasm for, for voting in 2016 was extremely minimal. Um, people were, weren't necessarily voting for Trump, they were voting against the alternative and, and, and basically you know, expressing a, a frustration with a system that simply wasn't serving them. Um, I used to, I don't know whether I've talked about this before, but, but uh, I used to well, obviously work for the Labour Party in Australia, but, but I, wasn't, I was never a member. Uh, and, and part of my and we used to do you know, elections all around every state and federal, you know, it's constant non-stop campaigning uh, because of the way that the, the election cycles work there, uh, you know, from one, one state to another. Uh, but, but, you know, my uh, amusement was actually finding out, finding out how many people didn't vote, uh, keeping in mind that in Australia, voting is actually compulsory. And if you don't vote, you get fined. Okay, so you've got that scenario for a start. So, so you know, typically in any election, you might get five percent of people who don't vote, who don't turn up to the polling station and, and get their ballot. Um, and what they do with their ballot inside the ballot box is, is of no concern, except to me, uh, because in amongst those people who voted, because you know, uh, you would have you know informal votes, you know, or, or invalid votes. Uh, and they would typically comprise, you know, in some cases, you know, six, seven, up to 10% of the vote. So even in, in Australia, where you've got these, uh, you, know, you know, very marginal seats, which are 50-50, the difference in, in pushing one candidate over the line is motivating non-voting -vo non voters to vote and, 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 and motivating uh, informal voters to actually you know, use their pen and fill it in properly. Uh, that's that is the difference between uh, you know a marginal seat and and, and winning it. it is motivating your, your base. And unless they can do that in the U.S., when that looks like they have done that, uh, given the you know the, the cues and things that we've seen so far, uh, the 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 enthusiasm of those fifty percent of people who did not vote in the American election last time, I, I think is just going to completely overwhelm. Um, uh, Trump this time. That's my prediction. Good. Good. <laughs> I like hearing that. Well, that fits my, <laughs> my bet, strength. so that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, mm. I'm gunning for you. <laughs> <laughs>
You will. Okay. 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 We'll see you, okay. Right. See you later. Bye. Have good Bye -bye. days and evenings. Yeah. <laughs>